Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's it's always like different to not be, you know, very, like in front of actual people in the real world. So looking forward to make perhaps the next Airflow Summit <laughs> to be uh, to be in person here. But uh, but really excited uh, to be here talking about operating contexts. Um, this is a talk that I've been meaning to give for a long time. So I think it's overdue for someone to talk about some of the patterns here around running DAGs and dev uh, staging prod and beyond. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to approach the subject today. Um, I looked a little bit around if, if people have given similar talks or written blog posts on the topic and I didn't find much on this topic. So excited to, to trailblaze a little bit. So um, what's in this talk? So talking about operating context, what the heck is that? What does that mean? How do you do like what? What, what are those used for? What's this idea about um, how to implement those simply? Some kind of typical patterns that, uh, that I've observed or used in the past um, and, and some more creative patterns as well. And then, uh, and then I'll wrap up talking a little bit about uh, building a case for, for, to add some of these ideas um, as part of Airflow's information architecture. Um, so let's get started a little bit about me. Uh, before I jump uh, right in the topic of the day. So um, I think one thing that really defines me professionally is, uh, is just my passion for building data tools and, uh, and more specifically open source data tools. Um, so that's what I've been doing since I originally started Airflow uh, when I was at Airbnb in 2014. So it's been, uh, it's been quite a few years already and we've come such a long way. It's amazing to see this, this community grow um, I'm always amazed to just look at, you know, coming to the summit, just looking at the scale of things and the quality of the talks and just um, the, the way that the, the community has grown and it's just been amazing to watch and, and, and to participate into. Um, then uh, I started a, another project that's called Apache Superset that uh, soon after I started Airflow and that's been like very much like my, my main focus over the past um, six years or so. For people not familiar with Apache Superset, so Superset is a very much a business intelligence application, right? So it's a data visualization platform. It's very much of a web app that you can use uh, for yourself and for your team. And it's very much enterprise scale and in many ways a competitors a competitor to uh, to tools like you know Tableau and Looker and uh, uh, and all of the tools in the business intelligence space, but this one is open source, and uh, and it's uh, it's awesome in all sorts of, of new ways, right? It's it's more modern than a lot of these other tools, and it's a lot more extensible uh, and modifiable, and you can contribute to it. And we have like a very nice big community, uh, much like Airflow, to to collaborate um, around it. So. So that's a word or two about Apache Superset. I wanted to say too that if you haven't checked out Superset, you should check it out. If you haven't checked it out in a while, um, I would say over the past six months or, or six, six months to 12 months, we've made as much progress as we've done in the whole history of, of Superset um, since 2015. So, so the project is very much accelerating. So if you've tried um, Superset more than a few months ago, probably worth to take another look as the the, the pace of improvement as is, is just accelerating. Uh, more recently, um, so in 2019, I started a company called Preset. So we're at Preset.io and we're very much the, the, the Apache Superset company. Uh, that means we, we, uh, we offer Superset as a service and, uh, and then we're going GA mid August. So, we, so we're on beta now. But but uh, you know you can engage and use our tools. It's very much superset as a service um, in August. So I can probably kind of announce or whisper that we'll be launching a, a, a free a freemium type offering. So that means that we're going to give away uh, hosted superset uh, in, in a somewhat limited, but we're we're giving a lot, um, and then we're going to have a premium tier as well. So uh, I encourage you to check it out. It's probably the best and easiest way to try Superset if you haven't checked it out in a while. So uh, go to preset.io, uh, you can register, and then very soon you're going to just be able to sign up for um, our, our free version. And it's uh, should be clear too, it's not a, a, a free trial. It's very much like a free forever 
uh, with some limitations. Um, all right, let's get into operating context. So that ends the, the more, uh, the slightly, uh, you know, commercial portion or, of, the, of the talk. So I'm getting into operating context now um, and just explaining like, what the heck is he talking about? Uh, so first I wanna say, this is not, or at least not yet an airflow concept, right? So if you look in the documentation for operating context, you're not gonna find anything uh, because it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a word or a concept that I, uh, that I named recently and that I'm building a case for um, just to, to clarify like what's this idea what's this pattern um, I've seen I've seen a lot of similar patterns talking to a lot of teams that use airflow in different ways and here I'm taking all these ideas and try to bring them together in a place uh, and kind of cement th these ideas and this concept so what I'm talking about is uh, you know, you might have, you might think of or relate to more if I if I you know share some synonyms, but kind of a, a mode for your DAG or the idea of creating a DAG with DAG modifiers, a parameterizable DAG, or the notion of uh, for those familiar with with DBT, the DBT calls um, similar concept uh, target, and um, it's very much a, a common pattern that's emerging from the flexibility of the DSL and Airflow, right? So Airflow is very flexible. It's, it's a, you know, you, you define your DAG as code, so you can kind of do um, whatever you want. There's a lot of power that comes with that. And then, uh, you know, the patterns that are emerging are very much around, um, you know, being able to set different modes for your DAG, whether it's development, staging, and production. But then that this can be used in, in all sorts of different ways where you might want to have a DAG mode or running your DAG, your DAG in a way that's more verbose with a lot more tests. Maybe you're, you're testing things. Maybe you're running some backfills and you want to define a backfill mode for your DAG to say, hey, when I'm in this mode, I want my DAG to operate in a slightly different way. Um, so those are just some some of the the concept the high level idea. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go through that definition that I wrote on this slide here, which is um, a so what is an operating context in the way that I'm talking about today? It's a declared more mode of operation for a DAG, and and when you switch to that mode, it alters the j the the DAG's shape or behavior in a de deterministic way, right? So it's so it's the same DAG. But it's modified slightly um, to 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 serve maybe a contextual purpose, right? So maybe you want your DAG to operate slightly different way if you're in development, or if you're in staging, or if you're in some sort of like just like iteration mode. And I'm going to talk about some of these patterns today. Um, so the DAG life cycle. I just wanted to talk about this, and then uh, and then I I put a picture that has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Uh, but but uh, the I, what I wanted to talk about here is that the fact that different teams have different teams, different individuals, different pipelines have very different needs, and that there's um, there's kind of a maturity life cycle to all of these things. Right, a pipeline might might not be very important at first, and, and grow to become more and more important for the company. Similar with an individual or a team. So so and I. I think the idea of an operating context emerges in more mature environment and more mature DAGs. That's when you need to, to say, hey, this DAG, I need different mode of operations for it. I want it to behave in a very different or in a significantly different way uh, when I'm in when I'm in staging or, or when I'm in pro. Um, so some of the high level mechanics, how does that work? And I've got my dog barking in the background. Uh, just to, to, as a reminder, as a reminder of like COVID times and uh, working from home. So um, high level mechanics. Um, how is that implemented? Uh, an obvious way is through environment variables. Um, so the environment variable can can say, "Hey, we're in this kind of environment," and the DAG can pick that up and alter its behavior. Um, it's, there's also a common pattern that can be uh, good, and, and which I'll demonstrate in just a moment which is the idea of a function that returns a DAG object. So that way, using you know things like type annotation, you can make a little bit of a, an interface to your DAG where you can declare, this is how my, my function here that is expected to return a DAG uh, can take these parameters 
and then it can be really clear and well documented in, in that way. So I'll have an example of that. And then typically what happens, so as you switch your operating context, what are what are the things that, what are the mechanics? What, what is it gonna trigger? So a very, very common pattern is to change your, um, for those familiar with the DSL, right? I'm sure a lot of people in the audience here today are very familiar with, um, with uh, the, the DAG, uh, the DAG kind of function, uh, functions are the class signature. So changing your default args, changing your parameters, altering your connection IDs uh, to point to different places, and then altering data sets names and pointers to different data sets that you're operating on. So I think a lot of the solution, a lot of the patterns I'm gonna uh, talk about today uh, do this in, in some capacity. All right, so here's the simple, like a very simple example of how you might do that. Um, so here, looking at a tiny bit of code, um, and, and this, this here is very simple, just Python code that reads from uh, the OS uh, module or package, and uh, and it it used the OS.environ dictionary to go fetch an environment variable and be like, hey. What is the Airflow operating context environment variable set to right now? And then we're defining default args. And uh, and what's happening a little bit later, like at the bottom of the example there, we say like, hey, if, if the operating context is dev, I might want to have no uh, no retry policy in development, right? Because I don't need to do retries. I'm, I'm not in production. So here, um, what I'm trying to demonstrate is, is more just the mechanics of like, how would you tell the DAG that you're in a certain operating context, and then how does the DAG read and alter its behavior uh, based on, on where it's at. Um, at the bottom there, uh, copy-pasted uh, or, or screenshotted, uh, not, not the best way, I'm showing an example of how you might want to dictate an environment. So I think in a lot of cases, the environment itself would probably provide that environment variable, right? So you're, whoever uh, is running the cluster might already have defined this, but then if you're local and you want to simulate different environment, how would you do this? Just by using a very simple bash, you know, uh, one-liner where you set an environment variable and then run on the right side, you can see we're just running an Airflow command, com, uh, command but then we, we are first setting the environment variable that tells, um, that's going to get picked up by the DAG logic. The other thing I mentioned before was uh, in, if you're gonna define an interface to your DAG or you're gonna declare these different operating contexts like you know, prod dev and staging, then it's a really nice thing, I think, to provide a function signature that's very clear about what, uh, what this does and what to expect. So here, I didn't put in a doc string, but you could also assume that there would be a doc string defining very clearly what fast mode means and what operating contexts uh, means and what it does to the DAG. So that really enables the, the author of the DAG to uh, to give a really clear signature here and make it clear what, what's going to happen uh, when that goes. And now I'm starting to realize I have a lot of material uh, and a little bit of time, so I'm going to go fairly quickly through uh, through all of this to make sure that we um, we do have time for um, for questions as well. So a very common pattern is to basically, ba depending on the con on, on the environment that your operating context, you may want to just swap the pointers of your connection IDs. So Airflow has this notion of connection IDs that it stores in, in, in its metadata database. And um, I think it's, it's fairly easy to say, I'm gonna define my Snowflake connection or my Presto connection, and I'm gonna define different connections one that's called, say, Snowflake Prod, and one that's called Snowflake Staging and Snowflake Dev. And uh, and to just say, depending on the environment that I'm in, I'm gonna change my connection IDs. I think this is pretty easy to reason about, right? To say like, hey, I've got my infrastructure has different connections and different, perhaps, physical databases or different user roles, right? Maybe it's a different username, uh, so I'm gonna say, I'm gonna point to different place depending on where I'm at. That's very much your your classic, like um, your, your data warehouse, 
you have one data warehouse for each environment and it's isolated. So not everyone has the luxury to have a full data warehouse, uh, you know, for in staging and dev that gets pretty prohibitive. So many, many environments don't necessarily have different database um, for their different to support different environments. So we're going to get into different examples there that do this in different ways. So the pattern, another pattern is to keep the same database connection, but to point to different schemas, right? So if you have, um, you know, a Presto cluster or a Postgres database that you're using, uh, you might want to just use a single connection and a single uh, data warehouse, but then to say, depending on where I'm at in my DAG, if I'm if I'm in dev or staging, I'm going to point to different schemas. Uh, so here, here we're reading the operating context and creating a schema suffix, and we're altering these parameters based on um, based on the context we're in. So you can assume that somewhere there's some SQL that says select from or insert into. And then it prefixes the, to point to the right schema, depending on your environment. Here um, is another pattern that I've used quite a bit in the past. Personally, I've witnessed other people using is the idea of doing some sort of crossover environment. So, so that's probably not clean conceptually in a lot of ways, right? Because you're, you're doing some interest, like just crossover environments and there's less isolation, but it can be really convenient as you get these very large complex DAGs. So I'm gonna try to explain what this is here. So imagine that you have a certain source that's external and then you have prod and dev and uh, and then you, you have, you can run your prod pipeline. It will go one, two, three, you know, run your linear pipeline. And then you can have dev, it's gonna do similar thing. Then in this crossover mode, it's a mode in which you would source data from the production side and load data into a dev kind of target. So you don't have to run the whole thing. Um, if picture a DAG that has you know 200 nodes um, and you wanna test like the last, the very last node, and that's the only one that you're changing. What you might want to do is just get in this crossover mode and just run that last task ID and then have that task ID source from production and load into dev. So then you can go and do your assertion, do your test and make sure that everything is working well without running the 200 steps uh, prior to that step. So it's a pretty convenient uh, mode to have for faster iterations. Um, here, another pattern, limiting data set. So, so that's more the idea of I want to run something like a dry run, or I don't want, perhaps there's limitation on, on uh, you don't want the pipeline to run for a long time or to be costly, right? So that might be, uh, you might be running a big job that takes 10 minutes to run or that um, that costs, you know, a significant amount of money to, to run and you just want to have this lean mode. So here it's pretty easy to say, uh, here we're assuming that we have some sort of fast mode that's been defined and if, we're in that mode, we're gonna apply some limit statements to our, our SQL. Um, so here, for the convenience of this talk, I, I decided to just go with SQL just because it's it's something easy that people can relate to, but you can assume that you'd have something similar going on for uh, you know a Spark pipeline where you'd, set, you'd squeeze in some sort of limit. Hey Max, um, uh, sorry, yes. sorry to interrupt, but we will need to wrap it up. Okay, how much time do we have? How much time do I have? I'm getting close to my last slides. A few, uh, few, few you, minutes. You don't have you don't have uh, time at all. Uh, but, oh, no, uh, about, I, I thought I had 20 minutes, uh, and we started a little bit late. Uh, let let me wrap up. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take two sure. minutes. Um, so general idea: um, add a limit clause here. Uh, there's another idea that's to bring in some fixtures and source uh, as a source data set. So I think that's really good if you want to write thorough. Um, unit tests where you don't want to do really specific assertions. So you, you can point your source data set to be a fixture, which is a static data set. And then you're, you can add new assertions that are going to be very specific to that data set. Um, I think we could bring some of these semantics to Airflow. That'd be really good um, for a whole set of reasons that are defined here. Maybe I'll bring that up as an Airflow improvement proposal. Um, that, that would add semantics and, and uh, it would make it easier for people to reason about their operating contexts. Um, I'm not going to get into the conclusions here, but uh, the idea is like get creative, um, 
go don't, don't go too crazy though uh because you know you want for your dag to uh to, to kind of be somewhat predictable um going very quickly here um maybe that's the most important and as i wrap up is i will i have a blog post going i'm going to publish soon so you can read all the ideas in a in a way that's not going to be so rushed towards the end uh so all the information here will be in a structured blog post soon so you can learn more about it and then uh and then i i, I wanted to talk about a little bit some other talks that you should check out but we had a superset for engineer talk that you should check out um really passionate about the idea of like open standards for metadata so there was a, a, a talk here uh last night that you can watch that's published now and that's all folks <laughs>